just want to be sure my screen is shared or not because not presently sir yeah, but i had shared it already uh, how do we do it again so you come to zoom and click the green button once you come to zoom where you can see all of us uh, give me where you can see our videos i can see your video just below on the bottom there will be a green button called share screen i i know about that just give me a minute the game should be launch meeting you just shared it but i can see your photograph as your video yes No, your your video is not yet shared. Sir. Maybe again click the share screen, go to the video, share again, do the entire process. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Yes. Doctor Sudhir, I think he has lost the connection. No, he's here. He's muted. Sir, you are muted. Okay. Yeah. Now. Now. Uh, am just... I am, am I audible? You are yes, audible. Just try sharing the screen again. Done it already. Do it once again. Doctor Ashok. Yes, sir. Okay, now. Should we start the introduction part on air? We can. can. Because it will take. No, no. Okay, minutes. now it is coming. And now uh, it has come, sir. Uh, voice also, sound also. Yes, yeah, sound also. So okay. may Doctor Siroi can introduce and we can start, sir. Okay, dear. Siroi, sir, you can start. We can go live in three. Okay. Two, one. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, UA webinar on Ortho TV. And for further proceedings, I'll hand it over to our convener, Dr. Siroi. Sir. Over to you, sir. Good evening, friends. Welcome to the UA webinar 17 this evening. Today, we are Talking about giant cell tumor, let me introduce our faculty. Our speaker is Dr. Sudhir Kapoor, who is a well-known person in tumors, bone banks, and PG teaching. He is past president of IOA and presently he is professor and head at GST Medical College, Gurgaon. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. I would like to introduce Dr. Sunil Kumar, who has a special interest in tumors. Dr. Sunil Kumar is a senior oncosurgeon. He works at Balaji Action Hospital, Delhi. Welcome, sir. I would like to welcome Dr. Mohit Dhingra. He is an associate professor at EMS Rishikesh and has a special interest in tumors. Welcome, Dr. Mohit. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I would, I would like to introduce Dr. Akshat Tiwari, who is uh, also an oncosurgeon. 
and working at Max Sakit Super Specialty Hospital, Max Sakit. Welcome, Dr. Akshay. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Thank you for having me. We have with us. Thank you. We have with us our dynamic secretary, Dr. Puneet Agarwal, who is arranging all the UOA webinars, series of webinars. Thank you, Dr. Puneet. And now I will be handing over the charge to our speaker, Dr. Sudhir Kapoor. I think I must. Dr. Uh, Kapoor, can could you hear, you hear me? me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, can sir. We can hear you. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Dr. Ash. Okay. Go ahead. So, Dr. Dr. Kapoor, please okay, start, start your presentation. Okay. First, my thanks to Tranchal Orthopedic Association. I will not uh, waste uh, much of Conjoint time. Cell tumor. Okay, sir. I am just starting now. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Visible. Okay, then. Friends, I am uh, Sudhir Kapoor from Delhi. Today, I will be talking about giant cell tumor. It is one of the commonest tumor and everybody of us is likely to encounter this tumor if we are in active practice. More being common, a lot of work has been done. Still, there are some controversies, some pitfalls, which we must understand before we can give the optimal result to a patient. I hope that by, by at the end of my talk, you will be assured, you will be clear about how to avoid those uh, pitfalls and Dr. how to. Dr. is the team is not visible to me. Is it visible to others? It is visible, sir. Gyrosal tumor is a benign tumor, no aggressive one. It so constitutes about here? 4 to 5% of primary bone tumors and 20% of all benign bone tumors. We know that it occurs in epiphyses of long bones, particularly after the epiphyseal closure. The common sites are around the knee, lower end of the radius, upper end of the humerus, and uh, about 5 to 10% of these giant cell tumors occur in excess including sacrum and spine. Somehow or other, the incidence of giant cell tumor is quite high in India and the neighboring Asian countries. The exact reason why it happens so is not known. That is why I said that all of us would be seeing some giant cell tumor in our practice. The treatment range is from surgery to wide excision. Depending on the situation, I'll discuss them in detail. So and just click on deny. As high as 50% in the series. Yes. But however, with the advent of modern techniques and the new concept, the sequence rate has come to a very low, low acceptable levels now. Basically, in this tumor, once you manage it, our aim is to have a local control of the disease while maintaining the limb function. The major dilemmas and the controversies associated with the management of GCT can be studied in the following headings. Are there any pitfalls in the diagnosis? Once the diagnosis is made, what is the choice of surgery? Whether we go for curatage or for excision? If curatage is chosen, whether we use a filler or we leave the tumor cavity without a filler. And if filler, which one? Whether a bone graft or a bone cement. And whether there's any requirement of adjuvants. If there's a requirement, which one to choose? And supposing if we decide to excise a tumor, what are the options available to us for reconstruction? Since it is a tumor involving the joint and excision would require a sacrifice of the joint, the, the choice could either be arthrodesis or, or an arthroplasty. Which one to choose under which circumstances? And finally, if we have an unacceptable tumor, what are the options available to us? I will discuss these, my, my, my talk under these headings so that all the controversies are cleared by the time I finish this talk. What are the, what are the mistakes one can make while trying to establish a diagnosis? It is not uncommon to find an oscillatic lesion, eccentric one, near the 
end of a long bone. That is epiphyseal metaphyseal area. And biopsy shows giant cell rich lesion. Obviously, a one would jump to the diagnosis of giant cell tumor. But a word of caution, please establish a firm diagnosis. Never go in with the diagnosis of a giant cell rich lesions. Because there are many lesions which can be giant cell rich and still not be giant cell tumor. The lesions which are giant cell rich include hyperparathyroidism, chondromic site fibroma, fibrous dysplasia, osteosarcoma, ABC, a foreign body granuloma, and in our country, a tuberculosis. lesion. All these lesions have a giant cell rich picture, but they are not GCTs. The typical picture of a GCT is multinucleated osteoclastic type giant cells surrounded by sheets of uniform looking rounded mononuclear stromal cells. Actually, stromal cells are the key. The stromal cells are the basic neoplastic cells in the DCT, which ultimately give rise to formation of giant cell tumors. This picture of giant cell rich lesion with typical stromal cells is the key word and that diagnosis the patient of giant cell tumor. Literature has such examples where a mistake has been made in this regard. This is one such, such case from the literature. I took it from a journal of uh, case studies. Basically, oscillating lesion in the lower end of the ulna and near the metaphysis of the radius. The surgeon excised ulna, this is a post x-ray, and do the dead cementing in radius, thinking it is a giant cell, multifocal giant cell tumor. After some time, the patient came back again with, com with complaints of pain at multiple sites, including tibia, including hand and scapular shoulder. On further workup, he was found to have multiple site osteotic lesions in tibia, in scapula, in hands, and in ribs. The biopsy was reviewed, and ultimately, a diagnosis of hyperparathyroidism or a parathyroid adenoma was made. Parathyroid adenoma was removed and all the lesions in the skeleton recovered spontaneously over a period of time. The, surgery, the initial surgery of extending of the lower end of the ulna and cementing the radius could have been saved if the surgeon had been a little more careful and had not gone to the diagnosis of giant cell rich lesion. Once the diagnosis of GCT has been made, the treatment is surgical, that is accepted without any controversies. Now, the surgery could be in the form of either a curatage or an excision. Now, in which cases do we do curatage and in which cases do we do excision? Before we understand this, we must understand what are the different grades of GCT. Only then we'll have an idea about which surgery to choose. Kompaneki has given three grades of giant cell tumor. Grade 1 is a totally well-confined tumor. Margins are intact. Actually, the margins are sclerosed. In grade 2 tumors, they are relatively though well-defined. Cortis is thinned out and moderately expanded. Margins do not have any sclerosed or radiopaque rim. And finally, we have grade 3 lesions, which are supposed to be aggressive giant cell tumors. They have indistinct borders and the cortical dissection is gross, like in this case. However, in our country, it is not uh, rare to find situations where the tumor is beyond grade 3 also. Let me show you an example. This is a case of a huge giant cell tumor of a lower end of the femur. There are no cortices to be seen. There is a pathological fracture and the, the tumor seems to be have gone into the soft tissue. This is uh, obviously beyond the grade 3 of Kompaneki. These are the patient's x-rays and the MRI.
the same tumor was excised and you can see that that i mean there is absolutely no wall there seems to be just a capsule somehow other we were able to excise this tumor there is no question of doing any curettage in this case and anybody would have liked to excise which i did it is accepted fact that in compendiki grade 1 and 2 ogcts curettage a uh, wide curettage is acceptable treatment while in grade 3 the treatment is still debatable whether we go for excision or whether we go for the curettage but more the cases the case which i showed you obviously the choice was excision only we'll discuss this little later also uh, let us discuss the curettage first i think over a period of years the technique of curettage has been greatly refined there's something called simple curettage which you just scoop it out the tumor try to clear the walls and call it a day however this has been found to be insufficient and now the concept of extended curettage with lot of uh, margin of uh, margin expo to expose the tumor and then do as thorough curettage as possible as far as the naked eye is concerned more recently the concept of extended curettage has come all of us must understand this concept and must apply this method if you decide to do a curettage in a case of giant cell tumor in our extended curettage is a te technique of intralesion excision where a bar is used to break all the ridges smoothen the crevices and extend the margin to ensure better tumor removal with the help of the bar you extend the visual margins further all around so that even the microscopic foci which are still in the tumor cells are also excised after doing the extended curettage should we leave the cavity of the tumor as such or does it require a filler this is the next dilemma and i like to answer that with the help of some literature available there are few studies in world literature which mention that a tumor cavity or benign tumor can just be curated out and there is no need for filler one such studies from india from rotak they had done 42 cases of osteolytic lesions of the bone and just done curettage and no filling was done out of the 42 cases of osteolytic lesions including this study 15 were of giant cell tumor and surprisingly the local recurrence after curettage and no filling was seen only in 3 cases out of 15 one was in grade 2 and two in grade 3 out of these three cases two were reoperated with curettage and cementing while one was excised and after that there was no recurrence how do these tumor cavities repair themselves after curettage and without filling is supposed to be the with the help of remodeling and reconstitution which gives sufficient strength without filling few septic form which control the which control or which provide support to the subcondral bone and the cavity of the tumor is are, is gradually filled up over a period of time this is one such x ray of 2 years post operative taken from this study the study which has been worth mentioning was published in 2005 from uk and was published in corr it reviewed 193 patients which were operated over a period of 27 years they have found that in few patients particularly when the giant cell tumor is intraosseous means it is not going beyond the confines of the bone can be managed without the use of a adjuvant or a filler however they concluded that in tumors which go beyond the bones into the soft tissue in those cases a filler is required however subsequently several studies have been done to review all the cases one such study was in 2009 and now it has been proved beyond doubt that leaving a tumor cavity of gct without filling has a very high recurrence rate as you can see in this slide and now most of the people accept the fact that after a extended curettage of gct an adequate filler must be used to fill up the cavity so it is an accepted fact that after giant cell curettage the tumor cavity must be used with an appropriate filler and what that filler could be we just see in a second this filler to fill up the cavity of a giant cell tumor which has been curated could either be a bone graft 
or a cementation. This bone graft could be either from the patient's own body, like autoglobus, or it could be a bone bank bone graft. Now, both have their advantages and disadvantages. Bone graft, if used, would require an additional surgery, of course, and the patient will have a little more morbidity. But immediate bed wearing will not be feasible. And, and if the quantity required is large, then of course, if we cannot get it from the patient's body, it has to be from a bone bank. However, this procedure is biological and ultimately the graft does get, uh, does get absorbed in the body completely. While in case of a bone cement, it has got a very mechanical ease to use. The heat generated during the setting of the tumor is supposed to be thermotoxic to the tumor cells. It is quite simple. Nowadays, not so very costly and immediate weight bearing is also allowed. So it has got a lot of advantages as the cement is concerned. There's plenty of literature available in which bone cementing has been done to fill up a cavity of a curated giant cell of tumor, you can, as you can see on the slide. One such study has very lucidly elaborated on the advantages of using a bone cement. We supposed to be mechanical, cytotoxic, inocuity, ease of handling, make curatized cementation one of the top ranking GCT treatment options. It is simple and reproducible, and the diagnosis of recurrence can be done earlier as far as this study is concerned. I will show you two examples of GCT managed with the help of cementing. The first case is of a case of a 32 years old female who had a lesion of the biopsy proof GCT of the upper end of the tibia. In this case, bone, uh, curatage, bone cementing, and a plate was done. The patient was able to be mobilized immediately after the surgery. One more example of a GCT of the lower end of the femur, which was again managed by a thorough curatage uh, using a burr, then bone cementing and a plating. The patient was mobilized almost immediately. Finally, I'll likely to mention one study which has come as recent as 2019 from India. It is by Dr. Raju Vesha and his colleagues who have done a systematic review of all the literature. And actually, they have concluded that bone cementing is probably a better option than bone grafting, and there are less chances of recurrence. This is a review of literature from their paper in which they have summarized different studies and move and ultimately concluded that bone cementing is better than bone grafting and probably gives a lesser rate of recurrence after bone cementing. Bone grafting is also a good option for filling up the cavity of a curated GCT. But if the quantity is required is large, then the facility of a bone bank must exist in your premises before you undertake this particular method of filling of the cavity. I'll show you two examples of uh, using a bone bank bone graft, which I've done personally from my institute. This was a case of a large giant cell tumor in a Nepali female, uh, bordering between grade two and grade three. A large cavity was encountered after curatage. You can see the size of the cavity. It required actually four femoral head and a piece of fibula also to fill up the cavity. The cavity was nicely packed, and this is the immediate postoperative x ray. X ray after six months, x ray after three years, and x ray after seven years. The final x ray shows a very good healing. Another case of a 43-year-old male, the giant cell tumor of the upper end of the tibia. In this case also, curatage and allografting taken from the bone bank was done. Again, a large cavity in which the bone bank graft was mosselized and the, the cavity was nicely packed, as you can see on the slide. And this is the immediate postoperative X-ray. And these are the X-rays and the CT scan after about uh, six months and uh, the, the shows that the cavity has started healing nicely. I do not have the subsequent X-rays, but at two years follow-up, there was no recurrence. So what is the final conclusion regarding the choice of filler for a tumor cavity of GCT? 
Well, one can safely conclude that bone cement is a choice of filling the tumor cavity unless facility of a good bone bank with ample graft is available, then probably, since it is biological, this takes priority. Adjuvants are other means which are used specifically in cases of giant cell tumor to bring down the rate of recurrence. Besides the filler, filler is one aspect, adjuvant is the other aspect. Filler, we have decided uh, that the bone cementing is probably better unless you have bone bank. Now, adjuvants, there's a long list of adjuvants which are available in the literature which have been used in giant cell tumor. The major of them are cryosurgery, phenol, hydrogen peroxide. Other adjuvants which have been used in the literature include sterile water, ethanol, electrocautery, etc. Let us first talk about cryosurgery as an adjuvant. Uh, various reports are available in the literature which have established the role of cryosurgery or liquid nitrogen as minus 170 or so as a good option as a uh, as, as an adjuvant to treat the tumor cavity before the filler, filler is used. These are the other studies which I thought worth mentioning. I'll elaborate upon one of the largest studies of cryosurgery in which 102 patients of giant cell tumor were managed at three institutions. Out of these, 16 patients had one of a recurrent GCT, while the rest were of a primary GCT. In all these patients, a thorough curatage and then treatment with cryosurgery using liquid nitrogen was done. The average follow-up in the study was 6.5 years and a very good uh, low recurrence rate of 7.9%. The total of eight patients uh, developed a recurrence and just two patients out of the primary group and six patients were from the group in which, in which were recurrent GCTs. Again, these patients were managed, the patients who had recurrence of this were once again managed by cryosurgery and ultimately 100 out of 102 patients were cured with cryosurgery. However, cryosurgery is not uh, as easily uh, used as said. Uh, one must understand first the facility of cryosurgery should be available. Second thing, the complication rate is high unless you are very careful. The surrounding normal tissue has to be protected adequately so there is no damage to the, the, the neighboring bone cartilage and the soft tissue including nerves and vessels. Secondary fractures have been reported after the use of this cryosurgery. A skin injury may occur and temporary neuropraxia is not uncommon, particularly at the upper end of the tibia when CPN may get a temporary neuropraxia. However, the advantages besides being low recurrence rate remain, the joint is preserved, functional outcome is good, and I've go, of course, the recurrence rate is low, which I've already mentioned. So our final consensus regarding cryosurgery is that it is a good uh, alternative to use, to use as a physical adju adjuvant. Uh, it is, also, it is uh, the effect is so good that it's supposed to extend the margins of a simple curatage or reception to biologically equivalent of a wide reception. And cryosurgery, when the fixation is also used, not only preserves the joint motion, it allows immediate weight bearing also, and recurrence load rate, of course, is quite low. The next adjuvant which has been studied uh, quite nicely in the literature is regarding phenol. It's, it is supposed to act by causing chemical necrosis of the residual tumor cells. However, there has been a mixed, uh, mixed uh, picture emerging out of the review of literature. Few studies mention that it does cause a significant reduction in the rate of recurrence. These are the other two studies which uh, mention, a, mention a recurrence rate of 6% and another 17.5%. However, other studies available in the literature regarding phenol say that it doesn't make much of a difference uh, if the phenol is used as far as recurrence is concerned. This is one such, one such uh, study. Reviewing the contrasting spectrum of literature available on the efficacy of phenol in GCT is concerned, uh, one can conclude that probably the adequate removal of tumor is more important than using phenol as an adjuvant. And if the phenol has to be used, it should not be used as a single adjuvant. Other things like cryosurgery or some other adjuvant 
must be added. I think that will be a fair conclusion so far as phenol is. Now the next uh, adjuvant is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is supposed to act by removal of residual tumor tissue, presumably with effervescent cleansing. And at the same time, it is not damaging the surrounding tissue at all. In that way, it is supposed to be acting and it is supposed to bring out and wash out all the residual tumor cells. Another study mentions the combination of hydrogen peroxide, electrocautery, phenol and style water has reported a low recurrence rate of 6%. To conclude regarding the use of and the use and choice of adjuvant in a giant cell tumor, one can say safely that cryosurgery provides the highest cure rate and lower reference rate. However, it is not easily available and there is a uh, there is significant complication rate unless the surgeon is very, very careful. At the same time, there are other, other adjuvants.
हेलो तो आपका ऑडियो नहीं आ रहा है जस्ट सर फिर एक बार वीडियो शुरू करिए सर या नाउ वी कैन हियर यू सर बिलाग ऑडियो इज नॉट वेरी क्लियर सर ऑफ द वीडियो I'll do one thing, sir. I'll I'll stop sharing and do it again. Okay. Sir, maybe you should try stopping your own video because uh-huh. your uh, data must be supporting just one. Yes. Of so stop your own video and just play the presentation. I'll do that. I'll I'll stop your video, sir. Oh, please stop it. Yeah. Well, keep on telling me whether I can. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. You can share. Is it visible now? These are the patient's X-rays, MRI, yeah. and the post scan, okay along now? with the 3D. Okay, sir. 3D Audio is good. Video See is that, good. There is more than grade three. Audio is not good. It it's is good, sir. Good. It is like hours, and very huge tumor. There is no no fun of doing any curettage in this case. It had to be excised, which I did. Adequate extraction was done. You can see the you can see the specimen which has been excised. You can see the preserved radial nerve. The process in C two and the postoperative X ray. This is a postoperative X ray. You can postoperative photograph. You can see the normal function of all the thinness of the hand. And this is only immobilization which is required in these cases for about uh, till the time the soft tissue heal. Let us say about two to three weeks. What is the other option if we wish to reconstruct after a joint cell has been excised? The next best option is that since we have excised the joint, the next next option available is doing an arthrodesis. Uh, arthrodesis has got its own advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that there is a the final structure which we get is stable. The disadvantage and and there is no revision which would be required in these cases unlike arthroplasty. However. Since the since these the tumors are present mainly around the knee joint, there is a altered gait as well as the patient is concerned, and the patient is not able to squat because of a fixed knee joint. This is a major handicap, but our patients are able to accept once they are told that they will uh, that the next option, which is arthroplasty, would require repeated revisions since their life expectancy is normal. So most of the patients in our country who belong to a poor uh, economic strata uh, do accept this option. I'll show you an example of that. It's a case of a 30 years old lady who came to me with a recurrent giant cell tumor, a very large tumor, which had which had gone beyond all the confines of the cortices. This was the patient's uh, X-ray. You can see. This is excise specimen along with the upper part of the fibula. Also, since we wanted to excise the tumor in total without jeopardizing the uh, any, any any breach in the tumor. This is a postoperative X-ray in which a long nail was used and double fibula grafting was used to also reduce the knee joint. You can see the gait of this patient. Well, the, she has got a altered gait, as you can make out, and obviously she is not able to squat. But this patient was mighty happy. First thing, the her limb was saved. The second thing, she knew that this would be the final surgery, and she would not require any uh, any further surgery if, in the case, the joint replacement has not been done. This is the this is the gait we can expect. In a case of 
जेंटल ट्यूमर ऑन द नी वेयर द नी हैज बीन फ्यूज्ड नो लेट अस टैकल विद द ट्रिकी सिचुएशन वेयर द ट्यूमर इज अनरिसेक्टेबल आइदर बिकॉज़ ऑफ द साइट लाइक प्रोक्सिमल सैक्रम और इन द स्पाइन और इफ द एक्सीडेंट इज डन इट वुड रिजल्ट इन मेजर लॉस ऑफ द फंक्शन इन दोस सिचुएशंस व्हाट आर द ऑप्शंस अवेलेबल टू अस let us see two examples of a situation where the dcd cannot be resected without causing major loss of function this is a case of a dcd of the proximal sacrum which had involvement of the s1 s2 and s3 roots along with the large soft tissue component obviously if we attempt to resect it is going to be a big surgery as well as a really loss of function of the bladder and bowel and other other problems Another case of a 51 years old male who had a biopsy proved DCT, proximal femur with a recurrence, large, very large recurrence. There was involvement of the there was involvement of the surrounding of the femoral nerve, and the cortisol was zero. These are the patient's X-ray and the MRI, which show very very large swelling involving the femoral nerve and the surrounding muscles. <coughs> scanning the literature what are the options available in these type of unresectable tumors i think we can uh, this this uh, slide adequately mentions all of them it could be radiotherapy embolization and medical management in the form of bisphosphonates or denosumab let us see them one by one embolization is a time proven method of treating these cases different types of particles are used to embolize if they are mentioned in front of you in the slide uh, the embolization is done at monthly intervals and in most of the cases a uh, good pain relief is always 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 uh, there as for the repetition of the embolization is concerned it will depend upon the patient symptoms as and when the patient uh, pain recurs further embolization can be done unless the tumor stops growing and becomes stationary embolization as such has got a role a role uh, otherwise also uh, as for the large tumor excision is concerned if used judiciously it can definitely limit the amount of blood loss which would occur in a otherwise in a large tumor uh, as has been shown in this study so embolization not only for uh, final management for initial management also if we are excising a very large tumor is useful now time proven uh, alternative in cases of uh, unresectable genital tumor is radiotherapy uh, for the very beginning a lot of uh, things have been written in the literature regarding the use of uh, radiotherapy in absolutely difficult situations where no no thing else is possible this is just a list of uh, publications in front of you on the slide however use of radiotherapy is fraught with the danger of sarcomatous change this has been realized uh, since many many years particularly in older days when the methods of giving radiotherapy were not so refined there are many many reports like this report which tells the dangers of using radiotherapy in cases of genital uh, tumor the tumor which results from radiotherapy is either a osteosarcoma or a undifferentiated uh, sarcoma however methods of uh, employing radiotherapy have been refined in recent times Uh, particularly with the use of mega voltage radiation the chances of sarcomatous change are uh, reduced to a large extent which has improved in many studies like this one and this one in which it has been again realized that a mega voltage uh, radiotherapy uh, given in the maximum maximum uh, amount extent of 45 grays is is a uh, is is reasonably uh, safe and chances of developing a sarcomatous change are quite low so the final uh, uh, verdict so far as radiotherapy in this situation is concerned well radiotherapy can be employed in inaccessible sites or on the patients who have got multiple recurrences where the uh, complete surgical resection would uh, would alter the function of the limb but however the newer modalities that is mega voltage and maximum to the dose of 45 grays should be used in the recent times besides radiotherapy
be the age old method of uh, dealing with the unresectable tumors or more recent use of embolization few medical agents have been uh, successfully employed to control giant cell tumor in difficult situations these include delosumab and bisphosphonates let us see them one by one a uh, bisphosphonates particularly pemidronate and zolodrenate have been used in uh, this type of giant cell tumors there are various reports which are available in the literature they have been used both locally in the inside the tumor cavity and by intravenous use over a period of time these are the other publications which are available in the literature regarding the use of bisphosphonates the bisphosphonates which have been used both uh, intralesionally and systemically they are supposed to stop the progression of gct by apoptosis however they have been found to stabilize the uh, lesion and prevent its, uh, the progression of gct however by themselves they are, they are, they are not able to uh, cure or eliminate the gct altogether as far as the dose and the duration of uh, bisphosphonates in gct is concerned i think the literature lacks a definite regime which can be followed by uh, all of us however as an example i think this case is uh, this uh, series is worth mentioning which was conducted by uh, dr zira singh kundu from rohtak uh, he had dealt with 37 cases of biopsy proof gct in which a four grams of zoledronic acid iv was given in three doses at interval of three weeks each and two weeks after the last dose the patients were operated the repeat biopsy of the lesion which was excised showed a good response to zoledronic acid another uh, medical agent denosumab has been much in discussion in the management of difficult uh, situations as well as the giant cell tumor is concerned to understand the mechanism of action of uh, denosumab uh, we have to understand basically one thing i'll take you a little of pathophysiology that there is a diverse array of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines along with few enzymes which are present in a case of giant cell tumor majority of them include receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa b ligand or the rankle then interleukin 6 tumor necrosis factor then and few monocyte recruiting chemo uh, chemokines like sdf1 and mcp1 this is a, a little difficult name to remember but anyhow uh, out of all these the most important is probably rankle this is a complete list of all the cytokines chemokines and the enzymes which are important in the pathophysiology of this diagram uh, depicts the basically pathogenesis of gct it is the culprit of the uh, stromal cells which produce some chemo uh, once they have become malignant they are producing certain enzymes and chemotoxic agents which are already named which recruit monocytes from the bloods and have convert these monocytes into ultimately giant cells this is the this is in nutshell the pathogenesis of the gct the long list of uh, different uh, chemokines and uh, uh, enzymes mentioned by me earlier i think rankle is probably the most significant and fortunately there are few medical agents which are effective against this rankle and that is basically delosumab delosumab is basically a fully humanized monoclonal antibody and is directly against this rankle uh, rankle uh, rank rankle mechanism to stop the progression of giant cell tumor delosumab is given in the doses of 120 uh, mg every 4 uh, weeks except that in the first month it is given on day 8 and day 50 also so basically thrice a Uh, three times uh, in the first month and then every month mostly three or four doses are given but however the total amount and duration of the uh, drug will depend upon the situation to situation the current indications of using this drug in gct include either a recurrent or a unacceptable tumor or a very large tumor 
which in, in which it may be used to decrease the size and the vascularity. Contrary again includes the pregnancy and the pediatric and the women of childbearing age. The adverse effects which have been noted are pain in the extremity, back pain, headache, etc. Uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw in very, very unusual, uh, very, very rarely. And uh, similarly, pathological fracture of the long bones has also been reported in the literature. Now, recently, one thing alarming has been a possibility of malignant transformation. Uh, some, uh, few reports have come recently, and this is a very, uh, this is a very uh, serious complication. Obviously, and it, it needs uh, uh, using this drug with caution. This example of a giant cell tumor of a lower end of the radius, uh, in which the denosuma was given to reduce the size and the vascularity, and ultimately the uh, ultimately the accident was done. This is the pre uh, medicine photograph and this is the x-ray and this is the post denosuma x-ray which shows good amount of healing. I will uh, draw the attention of the audience towards a paper which has been published last year by the same authors who had first described rank rankle pathway. I think it is a paper which everybody of, should, everybody of us should understand. These authors have reviewed different papers available in the literature uh, regarding the use of denosumab. They have come to the conclusion that the denosumab may increase the risk of local recurrence. And this is a list of all the, all the papers which have given, a, uh, given, a incident, uh, given an incidence of recurrence after the, after the use of this drug. These uh, authors have also summarized uh, the very grave risk of malignant transformation of giant cell tumor after use of Tensuma. Now, this is the, they have compiled all the cases reported in the literature till now in which a malignant transformation have occurred. Though the number is small, but this, there is a risk and everybody of us should understand this problem also. Other authors have concluded that since the uh, after denosuma, the, there is a sclerosis of the some margins. Some tumor cells are likely to be entrapped in these uh, in these uh, uh, the thickened edges, and they will give rise to recurrence once the once the drug is stopped. Basically, we must understand the drug is uh, drug is active against the osteoclast, but basic stromal cells, which are the neoplastic cells, which are which which produce osteoclast, they are not they are taken control of by this drug. So those stroma cells remain. Once you stop, once you stop the denosuma, those stroma cells may just again start producing the giant cells. That is the basic concept of why the recurrence occurs. Second thing, they have warned adequately the, about the risk of the, the sarcomatous chain, those small, but the real risk, and we, we should all be aware of this thing. Well, friends, I am coming to the conclusion of my talk now. I think I can conclude in uh, two slides that proceed only if histopathology diagnosis is confirmed. Never ever go with the diagnosis of giant cell rich lesion. In grade 1 and grade 2 Kompaneki uh, situation, excellent curatage is the method of choice along with the use of a filler plus adjuvant. In grade 3, consider excision. As far as the use of filler is concerned, bone cement is the first choice unless good bone bank with ample bone graft is available in your facility. As far as the choice of adjuvant is concerned, cryosurgery is the first choice. If not available, hydrogen peroxide and phenol and probably electrocautery must or must be used in each and every case. After next season, in grade 3, Kompaneki, arthrodesis should be considered in our, in our country after explaining to the patient. However, if one chooses to do arthroplasty, an informed patient consent regarding the regarding the revision arthroplasty must be must be obtained. As far as the DCT has difficult sites or unacceptable site is concerned, we have the options of either using bisphosphonates or embolism or controlled dose radiotherapy and denosumab. I thank you for your attention and I hope I have been able to do justice to, to the topic allotted to me. Thanks a lot once again. Thank you, Dr. Sudhir. Nice elaborate talk. 
the presentation is open to discussion i would request the panelists so as to discuss to so that the audience is benefited the most dr sunil sir please unmute yourself please unmute you are muted dr sunil please unmute yourself yes i am uh, it was excellent presentation uh, covering the whole this set of treatment and management of giant cell tumors and obviously not everything which is new is good as uh, dr kapoor has mentioned about the use of denisumab uh, local recurrence then so local recurrence and malignant transformation so i think you know you need caution i think the take home message should be that you know what he said in his concluding slides that you know in the grade 1 and 2 you should sort of do extended curatage and fill it with pmma grade three you should excise followed by arthrodesis and sort of maybe in elderly people you can talk about uh, reconstruction with modular processes hello doctor uh, doctor mohit Yes, sir. I'm here. Uh, sir, excellent talk. Uh, anything you would you, like uh, to ask? Sir has covered everything very, very deeply, sir. And sir, I would just like to ask mm. you one thing. What is your take on uh, giving bisphosphonate in the post-operative uh, cases to prevent recurrence? I would say. Can you hear me? Am I am yes, I audible? Yes. 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 I will uh, submit that I don't have a lot of practice in doing this. a uh, particular agent that is this phosphorate but whatever i could found from the literature uh you authors have mentioned that we can continue this phosphorate for some more time but some more time has not been defined particular specifically i think this is one agent in which a specific regime i could not locate anywhere i do not have personal experience to tell you about that i was talking mainly about the literature when i was talking about this phosphorate Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Actually, no, sir. When we when we when we operate the uh, cases of Kaplan's grade three, there are high chances of uh, recurrence. And your series, your talk, you said it's almost forty to fifty percent. Yes. So, uh, like uh, giving uh, bisphosphonates in the post uh, uh, operative regime, uh, I just wanted to have your experience. I don't, I don't have any personal experience. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one That's more thing, sir. Uh, yeah. One more thing. Mm -hmm. Post operative bisphosphonates. But for how much and how long that the literature is not clear, so I will not be able to give an answer to that. Okay, and sir, one more thing, sir, uh, like uh, giving uh, pre-operative denosumab as a new adjuvant uh, chemo, right. Right. Uh, sir, <clears throat> how? Uh, because what I have found is uh, post denosumab that resection, the resection of the tumor becomes very difficult because uh, all the soft tissue gets adhered to these uh, tumor and the resection of those soft tissues. the surrounding soft tissue especially in case of distal radius where you have a lot of tendons which are running it becomes extremely difficult uh, to uh, you know take out each and every tendon one by one because the bone overgrows and uh, it actually uh, angles those tendons which are running uh, around this tube i think that will depend upon but i understand that will be in a situation where there is a lot of a lot of uh, soft tissue reconstruction a uh, lot of you uh, know soft tissue a component Going around the surrounding tendons. In that situation, probably what you are talking would be true. Uh, we cannot uh, generalize for each and every case as, as far as my understanding is concerned. Okay. But I, I think I will suggest that uh, Dr. Akshay Tiwari gives uh, his experience because, uh, as far as I know, he is the person who has got maximum uh, experience in this medicine in Delhi. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Taking me in and thanks, Mary, for ask, asking that question. Uh, I think we have to first understand that bisphosphonates and denosumab act in two different ways. Uh, bisphosphonates are the only class of drugs which actually seem to be acting somewhat on the tumor cells, neoplastic cells, not the giant cells, but the appendix cells. Uh, 
having said that, after a good curettage, there is no evidence as such in literature that continuity to uh, with phosphonates reduce the rates of hypertrophy. After a good curettage, in my practice, and uh, I believe in most years, people would not uh, depend on this phosphonates for the full or half done curettage. Are depending on this phosphonates for an unresectable disease or where you think there is residual which is as good as you know not operating and that's a different story you might want to maybe combine this phosphonates with serial angiolization or other things uh, for example in clinical cancer with the denosumab we all know that a day you stop denosumab it will start weakening and that's because it does not does not act at all on the tumor cells but only for ISIS diet cells of course so uh, so lab of course is only a temporary means of stopping the disease of the brain. The computer went on infection. Uh, our experience has been that in fact uh, reception becomes clearer after dinner because uh, that animals we said are of course great key and uh, why you are reflecting in your purity. To, uh, give denosumab, it ossifies, and the chances of tumor bursting or spilling. And in fact, denosumab also has anti angiogenic properties, so it becomes less vascular. A tumor which is less vascular ossified, it, it is quite easy to just remain outside the tumor and resect it marginally. And that's where I think denosumab has the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, function uh, where in the in the pre op setting. Uh, I think the, the the point that the soft tissues get adhered stems from the from the fact that you only use denosumab in locally advanced disease, where in any case your dissection would have been a little difficult. But yes, some fibrosis can happen, uh, but generally denosumab will make resection easier. As far as curettage goes, and uh, as Dr. Sudhir rightly pointed out, and also Dr. Sunil, uh, our experience is that after giving denosumab. The um, grade three Campanacci uh, tumors will ossify, and a rim will form. Again, so you start curating, but you do not know where to stop your curettage. In a usual giant cell tumor, you know the friable tumor needs to be taken out, and then you take the bar. So the trick after uh, doing curettage in a, a post denosumab case is to reach the pre denosumab point. Uh, when you are using your bur and your curettage, but generally I do not prefer denosumab when I am planning a curettage. I only resect uh, if I have given denosumab. So that's my take. I hope that answers. Yeah, rightly, right, rightly, sir. Right. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, I think a very a very good point, uh, Dr. Ashok was also uh, uh, you know brought up by Dr. Kapoor in terms of whether to fill or not and. If we have to fill, what should we use to fill? Whether it's a bone graft or a cement, and I think that always remains a dilemma in the minds of the surgeon, and particularly for the younger lot who's uh, listening. Uh, I think generally there is little to choose between the two. Uh, what you would, uh, the criteria that you would use to fill with bone cement versus bone graft is number one, the choice of the surgeon and the patient. Number two, the size of the cavity, whether you have got bone bank or not, or if this cavity is small enough to be filled with autologous graft. Generally, I uh, prefer uh, cement. I love cement a lot because it saves the morbidity of uh, you know taking autologous graft. It doesn't need a bone bank. And it's uh, as Dr. Kapoor said, uh, the rehabilitation is much easier. You can make the patient walk earlier. Uh, you can pick up the recurrences very uh, uh, easily because uh, they will usually happen around the, the rim that surrounds the cement. So all this combined, I think uh, in my hands, I prefer cement over bone grafts. But of course, uh, you know, they both have, will have their own advantages and disadvantages. So, sir, as uh, sir said, uh... As uh, uh, Dr. Kapoor said, ke, to use a fixation device along with the cement. So, uh, is it always necessary to uh, put a fixation device along with the cement, or we can just go along just with the cement? And... So, uh, should I answer? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, can I can you chip in? Yes, sir. I I feel once you put in the device, it doesn't take much of a time. 
you become a little more confident of allowing weight bearing. I mean, uh, cement by itself does allow weight bearing, but after putting a device, you are absolutely sure that nothing is going to happen as far as the giving way of the tumor is concerned. So I would uh, like to put in a device after cement if possible. If something is beyond your control, you are not able to put the device, it's a different matter. But given a choice, it doesn't take much time and you feel more confident in the lying weight bearing. This will be my, my suggestion. So adding on to that, uh, generally fixation, again, is a very subjective choice made by the surgeon. Uh, there have been attempts at, uh, you know, objectively defining criteria where you would need fixation, where you would not. But I have not found them uh, very useful and very reproducible. And it's usually um, uh, cases where you do not have a contained cavity with three good cortices. Suppose you have three good cortices and the fourth one you are using as a window. Generally, you can avoid cement even in a weight-bearing bone. But if uh, the, uh, the extent of cortical containment is less than three sides, you would generally want some uh, device to hold the cement in place. Sometimes, you know, we have seen that cement just pops out because the bone itself was so weak once it is loaded. So that is uh, a little subjective. I think as Dr. Kapoor said, you should err on the side of over fixing rather than under fixing. Uh, it could be an intramedullary device. For example, in distal radius, we use a quad, quad of uh, K wires, which, uh, you know, go a little distance into the canal and just keeps the cement in place. So that is also fine. And in weight bearing bones, you would uh, nowadays use periarticular locking plates, both for distal femur and proximal tibias. So it uh, kind of gives you the confidence of early weight bearing. It prevents the cement from popping out and uh, holds it in place. So uh, fixation, yes, is quite useful in such cases. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other point that we want to discuss uh, in Dr. Kapoor's uh, presentation? Dr. Sunil? Yeah. Anything else? We no, I, no I, it's been extremely uh, obviously, you, as you said that, you know, if uh, three cortices are intact, you don't need to internally fix it. But see, obviously, if the cavity is large, probably you need to sort of, you know, fix it. And it will obviously certainly give you good results. But I think, you know, if you're fixing them, you need to ensure that in the um, cavity, you uh, just sort of, you know, the distal screws, if you're going to do the distal femur, you distal screws stay in the cement and not sort of cross the bone into the normal bone. Obviously, proximally, you will be fixing the normal bone. So, in fact, I have been using it crossing the cortex mm. uh, for distal femur and proximal tibia. Mm. Uh, my philosophy has been that, you know, if it holds both the cement and the bone, it will make a single rigid construct. And so mm. the weight bearing will happen uh, both across the cement and the cortex. But I think that's, again, a personal choice. Uh, again, uh, surgeons will vary between uh, cementing first or putting the screws first. So uh, there has been, uh, you know, uh, apprehension quite often whether you should, uh, you should put in a screw after the cement has set. And uh, surgeons are wary that the cement uh, might develop cracks and stuff. But uh, I have found it not to be much of an issue, even after cement has set. Uh, you are, uh, you know, easily able to negotiate screws uh, through the cement, whether you cross the cortex or not. Uh, right. I like you that, sir. The locking plates, you can actually put in the screw, lock them so that they stay in place and then you can later on cement as well. So again, that is a matter of uh, choice. Dr. Ashok, please unmute. So you do, uh, do first you do cementing, then put the screws or you put the screws and then cement? Okay. So I usually put in the cement first and uh, I will usually have uh, both the diaphysis or the metaphysical side. And uh, before it sets, I want to put in the screws. So I usually try and uh, have the best of both worlds. 
so you put in the cement because you know this is not a cement where you are uh, using for a prosthesis you can you know play around with the cement uh, put in the cement and before it sets you put in your locking screws uh, in so that you are both able to uh, cover all the crevices of the cavity with cement and at the same time you do not have to drill through cement that is set but having said that even if you uh, have cement that has set you can easily drill screws through that it takes just it takes a little more time because once you have drilled the cement you know kind of expands with the heat and your drill hole uh, you know again becomes narrow so you have to drill twice or thrice and uh, possibly the engagement of the screw will not be that strong in uh, a, a cement that is set and then you drill it so ideally uh, you put in cement and drill your and put in your screws before it sets so that is the best way for me but actually i have found that uh, putting in a cement and then putting a screw doesn't make uh, much of a difficulty actually i have done this the same uh, same procedure in few osteoarthritic bones also put in the cement wait it to set and then put in the screws there's no problem at all agreed agreed even i find it uh, not much of a problem anything else uh, sir remains i think everything is clear I do, I do, the message I'll, uh, let me acknowledge one thing sir before i finish i mean besides my thanks to tranchal orthopedic association and dr sirohi i must acknowledge that a few slides i had borrowed from akshay and the police in lady hardy so i felt free to use those slides am i right akshay i think three slides were from from you i have i have also borrowed a lot of things from you and carried on after having worked with you sir. i think that was a great presentation and so exhausted that uh, we do not find much to discuss it has taken some some time to prepare but i think ultimate result was good i'm sorry for the loss of connection in between i think uh, uh, the effort which has uh, put in was uh, i mean adequate to give a reasonably good presentation uh, sir uh, i have seen this for the first time that the uh, everything has been present uh, uh, the video has been made before and and then presented actually, usually it is the other way actually what has happened is so, i have a reason behind that i have uh, participated in few webinars and in the end i miss that once you are not uh, looking at the audience and you are not looking you are not sure whether you are your things are being conveyed or not and the choice of what sometimes gets uh, gets uh, inappropriate once you are not in front of the audience so this is the method which we have been following in our college and actually i learned from that so i thought this is a better method and uh, your choice of words is correct you don't miss anything and you are able to can be your message adequately it takes a little more time to prepare it yes. takes uh, 3 4 hours to prepare but ultimately i think it is much better if uh, if we can convey your message adequately after putting in so much effort another advantage that is uh, you know that you are going to say it again i can't hear you the other advantage is that you are you and the host they are, they are both sure that you will finish in time <laughs> yeah, I was I was given forty forty five minutes. Yeah. So I I told them that I'll finish in that time. If it's live, yeah. easily over time, and you know so that is an advantage. And in fact, many conferences are now preferring speakers to send in their videos rather than uh, presenting. For precise reason, they can just line up the presentations and finish in time. Nice, sir. It was nice to meet all of you. So, sir, uh, the Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association is doing its uh, webinars regularly, and uh, most probably will be doing up to this month's end or some in October also. Our next webinar is on distal radial fractures, and we are doing it every Thursday. So, I would wish the audience to see our next webinar also. and i thank our faculty dr sudhir kapoor dr sudhir dr akshay dr mohit 
and I thank the Ortho TV team. They have been very cooperative with us. They are providing us great platform for interaction and uh, learning. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. So, I think we should uh, stop now and have a good night. Yeah, just thank you all. Thank you for uh, keeping CT as one topic, and I would request uh, UA to keep tumors as a frequent topic for your CMEs in uh, the future CMEs as well. So, tumors also need a lot of uh, you know uh, discussion and rediscussion so that uh, people are sensitive. Yes, sir. You, you, uh, I think that osteosarcoma can be taken next time. Definitely. Whenever we take. Okay. okay. Osteosarcoma. Thank you, sir. Point Thank you. Taken. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night, sir.